Welcome back to The Breakdown, a show about bodybuilding, fitness, and all things Generation Iron. Today we have a special guest, John Brown. Uh, he is three times Mr. World Champion, two times Mr. Universe. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> nice to be here. The guru. And of course, as always, we have our Sean Ray. John was the guy that started me bodybuilding. I was a teenager in high school playing football, and uh, I got injured, joined a gym, ran into his, uh, his roommate, Eric, Big Eric, and uh, John was off in Europe training. And when John came back, asked me what contest I was training for, and I was just working out. Next thing you know, he had me on a bodybuilding stage in six months. Well, actually, it was a little different than that. <laughs> okay. He was My story is true. <laughs> he was staring at me. Yes, that's true. For like four days, I go, who's this kid staring at me? So I figured he wanted to bodybuild, so I started, says, hey, come here, what do you do? You play football, what do you do? He goes, I play football. I said, okay, you want to bodybuild? He goes, no, I, I don't know. I said, why don't you try it? I knew he wanted to, and I got him ready for the, what was the first year? Yeah, it was the Orange, Orange, County? Orange Coast Classic Orange Coast. in Newport Beach. And as it turned out, we started working out, and he got me into bodybuilding. But I think the most important aspect of that was that uh, I actually wanted to be you. And we couldn't have been more different. Six foot two, 250 pounds from Compton. I'm from Orange County. And then uh, he kind of showed me how that would be possible, but it all came back to the work and the discipline. Somewhere along the way, I got out of bed and I showed up at the gym the next day and it just it kind of grew on me that, uh, you know, if, if I can train and lift weights and do what you did, then I can be successful like you were. And that's kind of how my bodybuilding career started with John Brown. And let's talk about the rise of your career. Okay. Let's get a quick summary. Well, as Sean said, I'm from Compton and I was playing football in high school and man, we we're losing every game. And so I asked the coach, I go, coach, let me ask you a question. How do they pick one guy to play one position in college? If I was a receiver or running back, how do they select that one guy to go to UCLA and start? out of all the high schools in America. He goes, I don't know. I go, whoa, what do you mean you don't know? So that kind of scared me and I thought, man, I don't know about this football thing. So I'm training to, to play football and I was in a park at Centinella, it's in LA, Centinella Park. It was an older gentleman that we knew. He would put the weights in his truck and drive us all to the park and we'd work out on the weekends in the park. Met a guy named George Caracas there and George said, hey, what do you do? And I go, I play football. He goes, no, stop playing football. You need to be a bodybuilder. I go, nah, what are you talking about? So make a long story short, he called my dad and told my dad, you know, hey, I think your son could, you know, win Mr. Universe. And would you like to try it? And I go, all right, maybe. So I went back to school, talked to my coach, and I go, hey, I don't want to play football anymore. Hmm. What are you talking about? I said, I want to, I want to try to, be, I'm going to train to be Mr. Universe. And they all laughed at me. Wow. But I just stuck to the plan and just kept training, kept training, kept training, reading magazines, trying to learn how to train. I know for you, you got inspired by a lot of guys like Serge Bray from mm -hmm. over in France, who mm -hmm. was a great bodybuilder. Not good, but he was great. Yeah. You, you kind of fancied him in terms of the classical physique. Because you're one of the taller guys. You're, you're taller than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. So you had to be big, but yet you didn't lose any of your lines. And in bodybuilding, you were known for your showmanship. So do you think your showmanship is what the world knows more about you than your physique? Because you're one of the few guys that can show your body, but you still, had, being so tall, you still had a few That's deficiencies. That's a good question. I, I think it's, it's probably accurate. And another thing I did, I mean, like Sean said, in terms of showmanship, I had a friend who was, uh, you know, just worked out with me. He goes, John, when you go on stage, he knew I could do, you know, break dance and pop lock when I was a kid. He goes, you got to do that. I go, no way, I'm not doing that. He says, trust me, trust me. So I never did. And all of a sudden, he was at a show. He goes, you better do it. He's standing backstage threatening me. So I, uh -huh. I did it. And they went crazy. So ever since then, I started doing these shows where I would do classical posing. Then I would do like some kind of pop blocking or something. This was in the 70s, yes. long before Kai Green. Yeah. And you were the first, by the way. I was I'm a historian. First. And I started mixing music. So when I was competing, they would just use classical music and they would pose and they would get off stage. I knew that I couldn't do my breakdance to classical music, so I would get like some kind of rap or some kind of song and mix it because the judges got mad at me. They were saying I wasn't serious about bodybuilding because mm. I was doing that. They, and they go, he's performing, he just likes to perform, he's not serious. I go, wait a minute, I am serious. So I said, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. The first part of my show would be dedicated to the judges classical music. Mm -hmm. Second half would be to the audience, which would be some kind of dance music or whatever mm -hmm. it was at that time. And, but I got a lot of flag for it. So that's how it came about. And what's interesting to me is 
I went to a competition about uh, five years ago, and they're still doing this John Brown show. Yeah. They haven't changed anything. I'm like, what? You have to evolve, you know? Mm -hmm. So in terms of mix, mixing music, doing props, I, I started all that. That sh the part that you, the element that you brought, it's, it's not as popular. Like when I go to a bodybuilding contest, they're just putting on any music, and they're just posing to whatever, mm -hmm. and there's nothing. You're, you're, you had a story that went with your music. You were trying to make girls cry. Yeah. I remember you told me you tried to make the girls cry in the front row and make yeah. love to the stage. Yeah, yeah. You had a philosophy about your posing that took you around the world, yeah. and I don't see that so much today. Posing is not easy. You have to, uh, how do I say it? You have to become one with the music. You have, to, you just can't use any song. Like I, I wouldn't. There's a guy named Eric that I was helping. And Eric wanted to use a particular song. I said, Eric, you can't use that. That's not you. It looks mm -hmm. weird, you know? Mm -hmm. You have to find something that fits you. I went from the toes to the fingertips. Everything had to be in one line. And every pose had to have a certain face associated with the pose. Mm -hmm. You couldn't just do right. a classical pose with a smile on your face or some weird look. You got to have a classical look. And the movement, the transition from one pose to the next, is the most important thing, the transition, the smoothness. You got to be smooth. You got to flow. So somewhere along your career, uh, you got injured, and that was pretty much the end of your career. You yeah. tore your pec. You were bench pressing. How did that happen after being so experienced in bodybuilding that towards the end of your career you would tear your pec? I was in Denmark, and I was doing a demonstration, a seminar, and I put, I think it was like 575 on the bench, and I took it off. I go, wow, it's really light. So I'm going to hit two. And it broke. The whole bench snapped. The bench, the like, bench snapped with 575 in my hand and shot me through the ground toward my peg. Wow! And you're in wow. another country. In another country. Did you go to the doctors there? Went, or did to, you wait to, went to the doctor, but had to come home and immediately have surgery. Tried to, of course, you know, sue the guy, but it's a socialist country, so it was really difficult. It was, it was awful. And at that point, I figured, you know what? I had already won those titles. I thought, well, and I started my clothing business. And I think I came home a couple of times, I found, I think like $40,000 were missing. And I thought, you know, I'm making money here. I got enough titles, that's it, I'm done. Was it tough to walk away? Did the injury make you walk away? Because some people get hurt and they still long for it because it didn't end the way they I wanted I still to. competed twice after that. After, but it, my pec, it's just my tie-ins wasn't. My best pose as a bodybuilder, as far as I was concerned, one of them was just standing there. Yeah. To just to see to me relax. standing there. Yeah, just relax. And I didn't look the same. I couldn't fight on stage. I thought, ah, man, my pec. What did you do for recovery? I had two surgeries and then, you know, stayed home and rehab, uh, physical therapy for like two months, but the, it didn't, the surgery didn't hold. Yeah. And it, and it, it came apart. Again. Well, let's not sugarcoat the fact that you did make it to the Mr. Olympia stage. Mm -hmm. What was that Olympia experience for you? Because you, you only made it there once. Yeah, that's because I got a phone call in 1980 invite me to go to the Mr. World competition in Paris, in the NABA. For those of you who don't know what NABA is, it's, uh, it's another federation that's in Europe. Right. But I knew if I left America, I would get blackballed. I get this phone call, I'm like, God, dog, what do I do? Do I leave or do I stay? So I talked to a lot of different folks and anyway, made the decision to leave. But once I left, no one in America or anybody associated with the IFBB or back then was the AAU for the amateurs, right. could hire me for seminars or guest posing. So there I was, was no NPC back then. Yeah, I was blackballed. But I knew that was happening before I left. But I went to a show in 1979, Mr. America in Santa Monica. And I forgot the little black dude's name. He looked real good. And I thought, man, if he doesn't win this, I got to get up out of here because this ain't right. Mm -hmm. It was tough then for black bodybuilders, you know? And he didn't win. I thought, okay, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I got the phone call. I left. Went on a circuit in Europe for five years or so. Won the, won the title, Mr. Universe, Mr. World. And everyone said, man, John, you got to come back to the Mr. Olympia. Because I was a really good bodybuilder, you know. So I decided to come back to the IFBB. It was uh, Ben Weeder. The guy says to me, write a letter of apology. I did that. And they're going to let me compete in the, uh, some show, some pro show in Canada. Uh -huh. But for one year, I'm not allowed to go to Europe, do any shows, make any money. That affects your livelihood. You're not, yes. a, you're not even a sponsored athlete. Exactly. 
So I couldn't make any money. Mm -hmm. So I'm saving all my money, and I start, the money started dwindling. So it got to the point where when I went to the show, my plan was to go to Canada and just go to the police station and say, hey, man, y'all got to let me stay here because I know y'all got to cook, y'all got food. I ain't got, no, <laughs> I ain't got no money. So I raised some money to get the flight. Two weeks before the show, they said I'm not allowed to complete, right, yeah. right? And so I thought, oh, man, so I was all crushed. I'm thinking, why am I suffering for one year, no money, and I just stopped training? The week before the competition, they called me back and said, you can go. But I was out of shape. So I went anyway. So my experience in IFBB w was not good because of that. So now you're retired, mm -hmm. you're doing a women's line. Uh, you never left, you left Compton for Orange County. You got married. Uh, we saw on HBO Real Sports that you had the three football players and it was all planned. Uh, but it was a different type of a planning because it's hard to give birth to one great athlete in the mm -hmm. family, but now you got three. Mm -hmm. Notre Dame, Stanford, and USC, mm -hmm. and your oldest is now opting for the NFL draft. Look, from the beginning, I'm a bodybuilder going around the world doing shows, and I didn't want to really seriously date anybody because I didn't think I would have time to dedicate to one person, you know what I mean? So I stayed away from serious dating. Long story short, I named the kids what I did. I had three boys, and I thought they would be great athletes. They could have been great doctors, anything. And so it just happened to be they liked football and they wanted to pursue it. Mm -hmm. I started training them and the rest So let's of fast team. forward. His three boys are all 4.0 students. Mm -hmm. They all got 4.3. 4.3 got scholarships mm -hmm. to the major colleges and uh, Stanford, Notre Dame, USC, and they speak three languages: yeah, yeah. French, German, and so, English. So yeah, you and your wife are quite the team yes. on raising standout kids. Like that's amazing. And so what, how does that, how do they compare to the bodybuilders that you came up with? Because these are football players. Mm. They work out. Mm. They spend a lot of time with you in the gym. How do they view the sport of bodybuilding? That's stupid, they said to me. Mm. I go, look, I show them my competition. Sit down, look. We don't want to look at that. We don't want to look at that. So I told my two sons, one's 18, one's 19. I said, do me a favor. Your dad, one favor. I want you to do one competition. Please, like the teenager Mr. Orange County, you guys are already Ready, all I gotta do is go put you on a little diet, drop some water, please. I'll teach you how to pose. Just one, just for me, just one. Mm -hmm. No, no, Papa, we don't wanna do that. I said, come on, please, they wouldn't do it. How do you see the sport now? Yeah. I mean, you've been removed from quite, since, since, since the 80s. How do you see it when you go to a show? Do you still feel yeah, something or nothing? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or just the current state of bodybuilding it's in just, general, it's, it's what very, do you think? You know, it's ugly now, Ooh. you know? I'm sorry. It's not, uh, and here's another thing. When I was training, you, you had to train your butt off. Mm -hmm. Because the, the drugs they were using now, they weren't available then. And if you took those drugs, you didn't have to train as much. So all these guys like test tube babies. They're not real, so it's not real muscle. They're not really training. And lifting weights without using steroids or growth hormone or insulin is a dying art form. Mm -hmm. No one knows how to do it anymore. What's your take on the gurus? Because you weren't a guru. You took bodybuilders and trained them. You didn't give us this advice on all the other things that encompass this. Well, you never knew how to, you dieted on McDonald's. You yeah. didn't know how, what types of food to make me shred it. I, yeah. I mean, I think, I think they have a lot of good advice to give. I, I'm just against insulin, growth hormone. I'm against those two things, mm -hmm. using enhancement, PUDs, PUD drugs. Them. Guess what happens? Baseball it drops. Everything drops. Every, and they never get back to even where they started. You mm -hmm. never get back to where you started. So let's say you were at a five. You hit five hundred, and that's what you're batting average. And you went on steroids or growth hormone. You go up to seven hundred. But when they catch you, you go down. You never can get to five hundred again. You only can get to like three hundred. You could mm -hmm. never get back to five hundred. That's why these guys fade away immediately. Mm -hmm and it's killing guys. Well, throughout your career, you were an artist, and you remind me very much of Kai Green. Kai yeah. Green's an artist, I mean, he paints, he draws, very cerebral, he thinks a lot. Mm -hmm. You ask him a question, he takes a long way to color it all up mm -hmm. before he actually hits you with the answer. Um, what do you, what's your take on somebody like that? I mean, have, have our sport lost all of our artists, basically, and now you just got a bunch of robots that are taking a lot of growth and insulin and- Muscle heads. Muscle heads. Pretty much. I mean, pretty much. It's, it's, the artistic thing is gone. It's just muscle building. I don't even call it bodybuilding anymore. That's interesting. That's um, muscle building. It's not beautiful. I got lucky. I came up at a time where 
bodybuilding in Europe was so hot, I felt like Michael Jackson. I was one dude in Europe raking all the money. <laughs> yeah, you were. Okay? Yeah, that's true. So when I went to a seminar in a gym, I would see all these cars and go, what is this? What's going on with the traffic? Oh, they come to see you? I said, shut up. Not to, they're not coming to see me. A thousand people in the gym yeah. trying to see me just to yes. talk. I'm going, what? Mm -hmm. If you went to Europe back then, oh man, they would, they would go crazy over you. Mm -hmm. So it was a different era. But here's what I noticed. I made one mistake. I bought a stupid Mercedes. I should have never done that. I bought a Mercedes SL convertible, brand new, just beautiful. And I drove it to Santa Monica Civic Auditorium, me and Donnie Wiggins. And I sat on the hood and waited for all the guys to exit the Mr. California contest. So I can, you know, say, yeah, look at me, look at you. <laughs> but I should have done that because they kept going, hey, John, what's going on? How you doing? I go, I'm all right. How's your oh, It's all right. But I'm sitting on this brand new car, mm -hmm. right? And remember, no one was making money, mm -hmm. only me. But no one knew I was making money. Mm -hmm. But I exposed myself. Exposed. And next thing I know, they all came to Europe. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was so pissed. How do you, do you, when you go to a bodybuilding show, though, some of the shows, is, is the production value and the quality of a bodybuilding show today worth going to? From Pretty much the same, yeah. yeah. But it was it just a little evolved. more, it had a little more, a little wow. more buzz back then. I can't, it just had something to it, right? It had no mm -hmm. social media, that's it, why. And everybody yeah. was a celebrity. Yeah, it was, mm -hmm. it was something, something different back then. Something magical about it. Mm -hmm. It was, now it's, 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 it's diluted. It's not the same. It's not the same intensity, not the spark. When it died in Germany, I'm telling you right now, the world is finished because it was amazing back then. What would have to happen? to bring bodybuilding back to that. I hate to think that it has a natural propensity to die. I hate to say that, but I don't know what's going on because I can't, I can't figure it out mm -hmm. because I love bodybuilding. I think bodybuilding is the foundation of every sport. Mm -hmm. So I think if for sure, if there was, well, if there's more money, it comes back quick, right? If there's millions and millions of dollars in it, mm -hmm. everybody wants to do it. Uh, it probably has something to do with the money, even though the money increased. It, it got a bad rap because all of the drugs and stuff involved with it. So I can tell you this, it's, um, I know that the growth hormone, insulin, all this stuff is very dangerous. It's very dangerous. Everybody has to be forewarned. I don't care if you're doing football, basketball, baseball, bodybuilding, don't screw around. What would have to happen for a resurgence in bodybuilding? Sean was mentioning there's not many teenage competitions anymore. I'm shocked to hear that. I didn't know that. Right. Without that, that's your base. It's natural that it would die mm -hmm. if you don't have your base, right? If, you're, if you don't have youth basketball, basketball would die. You got to have your base. So I think first thing is they got to get, make sure a teenager, teenage body weight comes alive again. Yeah, I mean, even Lee Haney was a teenage national champion. Jay Cutler won, Branch Warren. I mean, all the good guys from my era came to the teenagers. Yeah, right. Back then, we had magazines. Now you don't have that. Because on the, those magazines, these teenagers are opening them, and instead of saying, ooh, they're saying, oh, yeah. what the? Yeah, now they're kind of like going, that. it's not achievable. Like, I saw beauty. Yeah. Well, and also, maybe they're, they're not opening and going, oh, there's a teenage guy. That looks my age. That looks like me, yeah. That looks like me. I can do that. When is the right time for a kid to be doing it? Because your kids started lifting weights. They weren't bodybuilding, but technically they were. My know? kids started lifting weights at five years old in my house. In my and they always said lifting young stunts your growth. Yeah, I don't know where that it's, guy yeah, is. Kids are all over six feet. Yeah. I don't know who, who said that. I never met that guy. I believe you because I never, <laughs> hit, I never <laughs> broke five, seven. Yeah, I mean, my, my oldest son is, is six, five. Mm -hmm. So, I don't think it has anything to do with that. Uh, okay. I met a guy who said, John, you know, I thought you were crazy doing that to your kids, but have you ever did the research on it? I go, no, why don't you go on American Pediatric website and see what they say. Mm -hmm. So I did it. And they advocate weight, resistant weightlifting at five years old. So although uh, there aren't many teens competing, a lot are popping up on social media. Mm -hmm. And there is, you know, a lot of talk that these teens are using steroids. Mm -hmm. So what's your take? I hope not. I hope not. It's a bad thing. You don't want to do any drugs. Just take my word for it. I know, it, like I said, the problem is it's a dying art form. Mm -hmm. So people don't believe that you can lift weights and muscle can grow without steroids mm -hmm. or growth hormone. That is not true. 
the good experience I had was coming from Compton was, was good and bad, but I seen a lot of guys come out of the penitentiary, out of prison, 20 inch arms, 22 inch arms. I go, you can't, we just wouldn't believe it. And there was no steroids in prison. So I had the opportunity to lift weights. We were afraid of those guys, but we would go across from the, those guys. Whatever they did, we did. Mm -hmm. We copied them in the gym. So I learned how to make my muscle grow. And I believed that you could make the muscle grow without steroids. I hadn't even heard of a steroid when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. When I got into bodybuilding, I started hearing, I go, what are you talking about? A drug? Mm -hmm. I go, nah, I don't believe that. I didn't believe it for the longest time. I just lift weights. Just, just take my word for it. Stay away from drugs. Just lift weights and believe. I mean, there's more to it than just lifting weights. I mean, we don't have a time for all that. But if you lift weights and you believe in yourself, your muscle will grow, especially when you're young. Okay, so being that you have three sons mm -hmm. heavily into football, uh, what do you think of the state of national athletics, such as the NFL, NBA, yeah, and college sports? I haven't been to an NFL facility, but college, I've been to a lot of college around the nation with my boys, and I'm so shocked how bad it is. How elementary. It's Which aspect? The coaches that are the strength coaches? The strength coaches. The facilities. The, 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 the strength coaches. Okay. It's, it's, it's not right. It's, you see, this thing, I think bodybuilding is the foundation of all sports. Mm -hmm. And when I trained my sons, I said, thank God I'm your dad. Because it comes into play. Let's look at football. I'm, on, I'm at home looking at my son on television. All of a sudden, I can see he's depleted. Mm. You know, Sean would call me and say, John, come to my house two weeks before the show or four days so I can look at it. Mm -hmm. Or I would say, come look at me. And we'll look at it, okay, you're holding too much water or, or you look good, what are you doing, what are you even drinking, what are you eating? You can see it, because our eyes are trained. So I see my son when he's, de when he's depleted of water. For some reason, all the coaches want to know from me, what do I think about their program? What do I think about their gym? Because of my background. And I tell them, coach, I don't really want to talk about that. But if you want to hear, it, I think your program is terrible. Your gym is awful. Ooh. <laughs> no, it is. It's awful. So I said, Coach, let me ask you a question. Do you think the hamstring or the calf muscle is important to sports movement? Or is it like a tonsil? You, just, you don't need it. Oh, no, it's important. OK. Where's your calf machine? Where's your hamstring machine? Where's your neck machine? He looks around. I'm sure we do something. I said, no, no, coach, I looked, I, I looked at the whole gym. You have nothing. So why is that? And he'll look at me, and most of them say, you know, that makes sense, but they don't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, when I saw that and hear that, either you have a fixed mindset or growth mindset. It is unbelievable how elementary it is. It, it's shocking. Okay, so should steroids be fully legalized for adults? I don't think so. Well, let's, let's back up because they're legalizing marijuana. And I don't know, I mean, alcohol is legal. Tobacco is legal. Uh, I don't think steroids are killing bodybuilders. That's not, that's not an issue on our level. We've got diuretics, growth hormone, insulin, all kinds of other things. But I don't know any bodybuilders that are dying over using steroids. And yet, here it's illegal. You can go over to Kuwait in other countries and it's mm -hmm. legal. So if we gotta compete against those guys that in other countries it's legal, mm -hmm. I, I think it's better to level the playing field. And I understand, you don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Right. I understand that. But if they legalize jumping off bridges, you don't jump off a bridge because the other fool's jumping off. Unless you know how. There are some people that use and some people that abuse, but I do know that there's yeah. a right way and a wrong way. And we do know that they work. So even the responsible use of steroids, you're against it? For yeah. athletes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I tell you, I mean, here's the thing. I'm concerned about the youth. Because mm. if they find out that, you know, their heroes are doing it, they're going to do it. I think they already know. You know what I mean? And, and that, that, that's what I'm concerned about. Uh, I just think you got to be very careful right there. Uh, because as teenagers, I mean, you didn't do no steroids. No. You didn't need to do them. And I, I could tell you pretty much for certainty, most of the guys that we compete against in teenagers, didn't do steroids. But if they were illegal, you're saying that might be a temptation. They would do it. To do it. They would do it. Because they can get their hands on them. There's no checks and balance. So I, I think it's just, it's 
it's not good to, to legalize it because of that, because of the youth. Okay, so we have a new segment. Uh, we're s responding to GenerationIron.com comments. Uh, we want to thank Ronnie Walker for um, sharing his story with Generation Iron. Um, his comment is, I wish I was in my prime. I'll be 41 next month, best shape of my life, but recovery certainly isn't. Oh, to be young again, LOL. Listen, you're, you're never going to be young again. Once you've been there and done that, you've done it. You've got The mindset has to change along with the body. For me, I've taken extended layoffs from the gym. It clearly looks like it. But again, I think if you stay on the grind all the time, it's like racing that racehorse. Eventually, you're going to run the horse into the ground. Sometimes giving your body a break when you feel that grind is the best thing for you. And we are very easily overtrained. Mm -hmm. The whole sport is a, a situation of overeating, overtraining, overdieting. And what we forget to do is to take that break because we can't. Yeah, I mean, Ronnie, trust me, I believe that the that youth is wasted on the young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? If I had it right now, trust me. Yeah. So what are you going to do? You got to relax. You got to try to recover. Even myself, I still train a little bit. Not like I used to. And, you know, sometimes my, like my wrist is hurting right now from bench pressing and golfing too much. But you're going to have injuries as you get older. You just got to train around them, I believe. So our next comment is from Justin Allen. FFS. It's a distal bicep tendon rupture. Not the end of the world. Plenty of guys have come back from far worse. Look at Mark Bell. Dude falls under a 1,085 pound squat mm -hmm. and completely destroys his knee. Comes back to squat a 1,000 pounds again. Geared, of course. Generation Iron is ridiculous. Well, Shaking my head. Callum tore his bicep. He tore his bicep. He doesn't know whether he's gonna be able to make a full recovery. One thing we do know, he will never be the same. Um, Somebody that's torn their bicep, Dorian Yates, tore his bicep and his tricep, went on to win three more Mr. Olympias mm -hmm. once that happened. It's not impossible to come back, but they, they will never be the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and clearly, Callum will train those biceps with caution. But he can continue yeah. to compete like Vince Taylor did, mm -hmm. and a lot of other uh, athletes were able to continue. Yeah, Vince but went on to win five Masters Olympias. Yeah, it's not going to, it's not going to, obviously not going to be the same, but. Why is he trying to curl 400 pounds in? Anyway? <laughs> That's Calvin. Um, trust me, the body's not meant to do that. Mm -hmm. And what they don't realize is when you take steroids or growth hormone, it weakens tendons. Mm. Just one of the, 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 the things that happen. If you don't realize that and you continue to lift that weight, you have to expect you're going to tear something Yeah. because it weakens the tendons. So, yeah, and I think, you know, the young, when you're young, you think you can lift everything, right? It's, you, you don't think about the injuries, but as you get older, like the other guy, as you get older, you have to sometimes take your foot off the gas a little bit and think about what it is you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Make sure to tune in next week on GenerationIron.com for the breakdown.